Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of my Game Top Lecture series. I am Jason Bullman, the, the director of game design at Paizo and the creator of the Pathfinder role-playing game. Today, what I'd like to talk to everyone about is traps. Uh, I think, you know, I've talked about a lot of facets of the game over the past several months. Uh, from monsters and magic items to building campaigns and encounters, building uh, memorable stories. And I kind of skipped over one of the most basic components of the game, and that's traps. And funny enough, they're one of the components that gets most misused uh, by GMs uh, as they're building their game. They're, they're an iconic part of the game. I mean, you know, traps have been an integral part of the game since its inception. Um, and... You know, whenever you think of a priceless magic item or a powerful relic sitting at the bottom of some long forgotten dusty tomb, it's always guarded by a series of lethal and cunning traps. That's what our image is. That's rarely how they actually play out though. In reality, traps are usually little more than a nuisance. Um, you know, dealing a little bit of damage and before the party just shrugs and moves on. The opposite end of the spectrum is they are a total murder <laughs> device that brings the story to a screeching halt. In reality, most of our images of traps are from media, right? Uh, you know, I, I think most of the traps that come to mind uh, for me are from, you know, Indiana Jones movies. Giant rolling boulders, ceilings with spikes, you know, uh, darts flying out of walls. No, 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 no property has uh, showed us the promise of traps more than that. But for some reason in the game, they always seem to fall a little flat. So uh, for part one here. We're going to talk about the problem with traps. Why why don't they work in an RPG? And then we'll get to talking about what you can do to make them better. So I think the biggest problem with traps is that they're often just a gotcha, right? Um, they're, they just kind of appear. The players just blunder into them. Uh, and quite suddenly, because uh, the players didn't do the right thing, they, uh, you know, get dealt some damage. Somebody in the group gets hurt. Somebody gets, uh, you know, uh, terribly wounded and the party has to spend resources to fix it. And and it, the GM almost has a smug look on his face. I, I, I'm guilty of this as much as the next person. Looking down at the, uh, at the adventure, then looking up at the PCs. And you always have that tendency to ask that question. Are you sure you walk down that corridor? Oh yeah, no, we just, we make it to the door at the end very well you know and and you it it feels satisfying to do that as a gm but for the players it's really it's really kind of lousy right <laughs> it's just like well I, we had no way of knowing there was going to be a trap there um so I, I i think it ends up having a negative impact on the play experience so i i, I think oftentimes adventure writers and sometimes gms uh, have a tendency to place traps where they're least expected. Middle of a hallway, between two rooms, on a door that leads to a pointless closet, right? You know, um, it's easy to place a trap in a spot where the players probably aren't going to be expecting one. That way it triggers and deals some damage. And, you know, to be honest, for these kind of cheap gotcha traps, that's what you want to have happen, to some extent. But I actually think that their impact on the play space overall is actually rather negative. Um, players who get abused by traps start to fear them around every corner. And worse still, they can turn the game into a crawl as they search every square. And eventually what ends up happening in those situations is the GM just starts hand-waving it, not bothering to ask for checks anymore until they're relevant, in which case now you're actually telegraph telegraphing where the trap actually is. So ultimately what, what's happening is you're creating an environment where the players don't inherently trust the narrative in front of them. They then react to it by becoming overcautious. The entire game slows down for the GM to speed it back up. They start, they start bypassing all of it and the whole framework just kind of falls apart. But when used properly, 
traps are there to give rogues kind of a moment to shine or similar characters. I mean, I, I, I think we've all been in the party where the barbarian is the rogue and the, they're solving the trap is their hit points. But even for them, that is a function of their role in the game. So letting them take some of that damage and shrug it off and move forward is, in fact, a way for them to shine. But mostly we're talking about rogues here. Characters who have specialized skills and talents designed to locate and disarm these hazards before they deal damage to the party. But using them in the right way, giving the rogue a chance to shine, requires more than just kind of picking a spot on the map to put it down. It requires some forethought and some planning. And that's what we're going to get to in part two. But before we do that, let's go ahead and recap. So the problem with traps, traps are a GM gotcha. They're, they're just there for the GM to be like, ha ha, take some damage. They're put in unexpected places and th as a result, they can make the PCs paranoid about traps. Paranoid PCs then in turn uh, make the adventure uh, slow crawl, checking for traps in every square. I, I you know, whenever you describe like, oh, you've, you've thrown too many traps at the party and they run into like a library or, you know, and all of a sudden they're checking every book and everything on the desk and they're looking for traps under everything and expecting a trap around every corner. And in reality, there isn't even a trap in the room and it's just boring. The game is now boring because of traps. The opposite, of course, is a good trap gives the rogue type character a chance to shine, but avoiding this requires some forethought and planning. Okay, that's it. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's hop over to part two. Let's get into the meat. We know what the problems are. They're they're pretty obvious. I think we've all run into a handful of those over the years. I think it's 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 always the sign of a new adventure designer when it's just like trap in a random room. Um. So, yeah. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, part two of the the, the lecture here. Simple traps. I I break my traps up into two categories. Simple traps, which are just like it has an effect and then it's done. Um, whereas complex traps are, well, quite a bit more than that. We'll get to that in part three. But simple traps, um, these are by far the most common form of trap you will see. And in fact, these are kind of the classic trap. Um, you know, pit traps arrow traps, falling blocks, swinging blades, poison needles, you know, jets of flame, uh, spells that go off. You know, all of these are, are really simple, simple traps. The players don't do a thing, and as a result, something happens. They're attacked, some spell fires off, and they have to deal with the consequences. You can litter these throughout your, your, your dungeon, but you should be aware that putting these in a spot without any warning, without any notice, says a lot about the environment uh, that you're trying to build. Um, in fact, putting them in a random corridor gives everyone the sense that the dungeon is capricious or randomly deadly. Now that might be the message you wanna send, right? I mean, I think those who have played the chat RPG here with me uh, on Twitch understood that that first dungeon, which has a pit trap randomly in the first entryway, um, that was put there very intentionally to signal that this was the sort of dungeon environment that you had to be careful in because it was random and capricious. That's not the message you normally want to send. I, I, I think there are very specific dungeons where you want to send that message, in which case littering traps kind of everywhere might be the way you want to go. But even in those environments, I still think, generally speaking, you want to put a little bit more work into it than that. So the trick here is to set up the traps in a way that the players have a chance of guessing that it might be there. You're basically giving them a clue that something in the area isn't right. And through their ingenuity, through their guesswork, through their deductive capabilities, through some questions they might ask, maybe some skills, they might get led to the location of the trap, which would allow them to search for it and properly disarm it. It's in this way that you are basically leaving them a trail of breadcrumbs. If they ignore the breadcrumbs and trigger the trap, 
then they feel like looking back on it and looking back at the clue you gave them, they have no one to blame but themselves. It's turning the trap around. It's saying that the trap isn't to this capricious thing that's carefully hidden so that they trigger it. It's that they were given the tools to locate it, but they missed it. It's, it's a twist, but it's an important twist that prevents the trap from being something that the players view as just a random way for the GM to hand out some damage. So the way that I like to do this is to give it some subtle bit of emphasis in the description of the room. Uh, maybe it's particularly lit. Maybe it's, you know, there's an odd blood stain nearby where the trap was triggered before and reset. Maybe there's a conspicuous lack of dust or a burn mark. Um, some detail out of place is really all that you need. So if we think about, uh, you know, some of the classic traps, there's a golden idol atop a pillar. Well, that thing screams trap from a variety of angles. First of all, there, it's lit. There's like a spotlight on it. The rest of the room is kind of dark and, and gloomy, but there's a spotlight on that pillar. Second, if I were to describe that pillar, I would say the golden idol is sitting atop a carefully, you know, uh, uh, flattened stone that looks set in the top of the pillar. So now automatically I'm like, it looks like a button <laughs> and the idol is holding it down. I'm basically screaming, this is a trap. That's a bit more obvious than perhaps you need to be. But the, the principle is basically the same. They walk into a library and one book is about halfway out of the shelf. Well, that's really weird. And I guarantee you that level of detail is going to get them to be on edge. That thing is going to cause them to stop and suddenly search or maybe look around or ask another question, right? A door being partially ajar um, is a good way to signal that there's something amiss, right? Uh, I wrote an adventure rather recently that has a door that's slightly ajar when you approach this house. And lo and behold, there's a trap behind it. And what I'm trying to do is give you a chance to ask some more questions about it instead of just, well, we go and open up the door and trigger the trap. That's an easy way to gotcha your party and deal some damage. But it's a lot more satisfying if they had a chance to spot it, they had a chance to deal with it, and they either failed to do so and then triggered the trap, or they actually successfully managed to solve the puzzle and disarm it. Because in the end, simple traps, if they go off, are all about draining resources. They're rarely about killing player characters. And I, I say rarely because, to be honest, if you're building a death trap dungeon, these random simple traps can be killers. Oh, it's a symbol of death. Yeah, you didn't see it. You die. I think in those environments, the principles I've just talked about, about giving them a clue that the trap is there, is even more critical. Right? If, if a trap is actually entirely deadly, like it is a save or a die kind of trap, and you provide no clue that it's even there, well, now you're just being kind of unfair. <laughs> like, like in a death trap dungeon, the spear launcher trap that's in the hallway can be incredibly cleverly hidden. And if they didn't happen to check this one random square, fine, they take some damage. Great. No problem. If instead there's a symbol of death hiding behind a wooden door, like you open it and there's the symbol. There, there's no, there was no clue that it was there. It's just behind the door. <laughs> that's, that's kind of dirty pool in, in, the, in the realm of GM design. I'm not saying you can't do it, but just don't expect your players to show back up next week. So, let's see. I think when you're placing simple traps... The best way to think about them and to imagine how you're going to use them at the table is to think about them in the same kind of bucket of tools and options as, um, you know, a random arcane tome that needs to be deciphered, a strange omen that comes out of an idol, <coughs> or a stuck door that needs to be broken down. All of these are minor challenges that the PCs can overcome with their specific set of skills. A simple trap is the same sort of thing, but just for a rogue. So whenever you're planning out your dungeon, 
You want to look for these sorts of hazards and obstacles and opportunities and litter them throughout. A trap is just one facet of that. And that's what simple traps are best for. Use sparingly, but with intention. All right. So let's go ahead and sum that up. Simple traps. These are common traps, like a pit trap, an arrow launcher, poison dart, falling blocks, winging blade. They can be magical. They can fire off lightning bolts. They can, you know, uh, cause a jet of flame to race down the corridor. They can, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things. They, they're basically an effect that happens. People either take damage or they don't. Uh, putting these in without warning does send a message. You want to make sure that that's the message you want to be sending, not just unintentionally signaling to the players that this is a death trap when in reality it's just some noble's house. Like, I, I think that's an aspect of this too, is about knowing your environment. If this is where someone lives and it's filled with death traps, that's a real problem because they, they might get up in the middle of the night to go get a glass of milk and accidentally kill themselves. You know, that that's not the right environment you want to be setting in. But if you're talking about a dungeon or a tomb, eh, you know, maybe there are some death traps in there. So instead of just capriciously putting in traps, give the players a chance to spot it. And that is all about giving some facet of the trap a detail the PCs might spot or notice. Um, so I, I think that's the key, right? I, for me, a good trap is one that the players might be able to spot. Um, <laughs> yep. Spoiting. There's my typo for the week. All right. That's the only one, I'm sure. Give the PCs a chance of spoiting it. All right, let's move on. Uh, adding simple traps as often as... You should add simple traps as often as you add uh, challenges, simple basic challenges for other players. That's always a typo. <laughs> oh, nope. Ah, I leapt forward. All right. All right, so let's move on to part three here of the lecture. And this is all about complex traps. So uh, a simple trap is something that just fires off, happens, and then is done. Deal some damage, hurts the players, drain some resources, cost them time, whatever, and then it's over. Complex trap, however, is more like a full encounter. It's like it very well might be a combat. It lasts rounds as it tries to kill the party and they try and overcome it or disarm it. You know, um, they are within its clutches uh, and are in a desperate race to end the trap before it kills them. Um, so examples of this are a room that is filling up with water or poisonous gas, um, a ceiling that is lowering to crush the, the player characters. Once again, I'm just going back to Indiana Jones movies. That's that I that's where all of my knowledge of traps comes from. Um, uh, you know, it could be a statue that's spinning around, firing arrows or, or you know, swinging blades at people. Um, all of these uh, have the possibility of being an interesting, complex trap. <laughs> Somebody in chat mentioned that. Yeah, it very well could also be a, 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 a classic Batman trap. I agree with that. Yeah, that... Those rattle around in here too. Um, so um, I, I think complex traps can be subtle. Um, that's perfectly fine. I think a complex trap, you walk into the room and there's four statues in each corner, each one of which is holding a, a stone bow. And you're like, oh, that's weird, but none of them have arrows. And you're like, eh, this is clearly odd. Yeah, it's you're walking into a trap. So it can be subtle in that they, you know, or it could be obvious. Oh, look at all these statues. Or, oh, we walked into this room, the door slammed shut, and now it's filling up with water. That That's more subtle. But in either case, these sorts of traps are rarely entirely avoidable. These are the sort of thing that you kind of want the players to trigger, so having them blunder into triggering it is usually something that's really hard to avoid. Not impossible. Things like this should rarely be impossible, but it can be something that is very, very unlikely for the PCs to to overcome before it activates. So, um, the key here is uh, to making a good complex trap, the key is to make sure that everyone involved in it has a way to contribute. 
the worst kind of complex trap is one that just the rogue can solve. I mean, that's, I, you know, I, I think back to games like uh, Shadowrun, which basically is like, oh, we need to hack this system. Well, this is basically a trap for the, you know, the Decker. And uh, yeah, we're just going to sit here and wait for the Decker to solve it before the machine kills us. Um, I, I, I think, you know, a good complex trap is one that has multiple facets to it, multiple ways that the players can contribute. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, we make a big feature of these. Um, and we give you a lot of rules and guidelines about how you can add different facets to a trap. So while the rogue might be pivotal, being able to like actually go and disarm components of the trap, every other character should have something they could do. Like they could be attacking various facets of the trap or making some sort of skill check or saving throw to a help kind of slow its progress. So think about it this way. If they're in a room filled with, uh, you know, that's filling up with water and uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, these uh, sluice gates in the corner that they can use their weapons to try and pry open. And so they can make checks, you know, athletics checks to kind of pry it open and slow the rate of the water rising. Right? So everyone can be contributing because everyone can go and make those checks. It's an untrained check. It might be hard, but at least you can be helping. Um, alternatively, they could go and attack the nozzles and try and bend them or break them that are pouring water into the room. Everyone can contribute. It's just a matter of making sure that there are various routes to success. Now, and... and the reason why I stress there are various routes to success, no one of these things should be the only way to solve the problem, unless it's a thing that every character guaranteed can do and do relatively well. Otherwise, you risk the problem of like, oh, okay, so they're in this room, it's filling with poisonous gas, and there's a lot of different ways the players can can contribute. They can they can squeeze close the nozzles from the stone mouths that are that's emitting the poison gas. Um, they can uh, try and fan the gas so it doesn't build up as much. Um, or you know, there's one character who can be working on the lock mechanism to open up the door. And if that person doesn't succeed, everyone dies. Well, that doesn't work very well if that character gets overwhelmed by the gas, fails a saving throw. And now, now you got a TPK on your hands. <laughs> so it's always important to have multiple different things that players can do, but each one of those can lead to success or overcoming the trap. If there's statues firing arrows at everyone, you can work to disarm the central mechanism that controls all the statues, but you can also destroy the statues, and either one of those is going to cause the trap to come to an end. So... I think both, you know, when designing a complex trap, you need to think about your group, think about what they're capable of, and honestly think about what they will find fun and engaging in a trap. And in some ways, this is no different than building an interesting encounter for that party, right? Um, you know, an interesting combat against monsters. It's kind of the same thing. So when done right, these complex traps can, you know, in, in, in some regards, they can take the place of an entire encounter in your adventure, right? I mean, they occupy enough weight and enough time and enough uh, space within the adventure that um, you should plan on them as a full encounter. So, you know, if you have time budgeted for three encounters tonight and one of them is a complex trap, well, you're only going to get two more combats in there. That, that, that complex trap is going to count. But I honestly think that when done right, these can serve as a real interesting way to mix up your, your bag of tricks. Uh, you know, if the players are facing a lot of monsters constantly, you know, throwing in a complex trap can be a fun way to change up the pace. So I highly recommend keeping these in your toolkit. All right. Complex traps. Uh, they challenge the whole party, uh, they take turns, and they require multiple PCs to solve. 
room filling with water or gas, lowering ceiling, nozzles that shoot fire, statues that attack. All of these are good examples. You can come up with plenty more. I, I'm, I'm confident in you that you can come up with a, a wide variety of very interesting complex traps. I always like to include compact, complex traps in an adventure, especially one for new players, because I find that they are an interesting change of pace. Um... The key is making sure that everyone can help. Everyone can attribute, contribute. They can be attacking various parts of the trap. They can be disarming pieces of it, making it less and less effective. Or they can be working to slow its advance. Right? And then meanwhile, of course, each turn, the trap is doing its thing. Making attacks against the player characters. Slowly filling up the room, which is kind of like a death timer. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's a variety of things the trap can be doing. But every round, it should be ratcheting up the tension giving them some sense of time pressure that if they don't act fast enough, this trap is going to kill them. So before I wrap this up, there's one other quick topic I wanted to uh, uh, talk about and bring to, to everyone's attention, and that's traps uh, when used in fights. I think one of the most interesting things that you can do with uh, a trap is include it inside of a fight. Um, having villains that know about a trap and know how to get the most out of it um, can make for a really interesting encounter. But that said, this is something you have to factor in very carefully. Traps often have very high spike damage. They deal quite a bit, usually, for the level uh, that they are encountered. And this is because they're generally assumed to be encountered in a non-dangerous situation. So when you're building traps into an encounter, you really want to be careful about how you take that into account. They should be added and accounted for as part of the budget of the encounter, for sure. But you probably want to stay a little bit on the lighter side of what those traps can possibly be. Don't burn a great deal of your encounter budget on these, because their damage will be such that they can really swing the encounter in the wrong way. Worse still, the players rarely have enough time and resources to actually look for a trap during an encounter. So you're either going to want to make them pretty obvious and easy for the players to spot, and hence just kind of play around, or you're going to want to keep their damage low enough that when they do trigger them, it's not going to be spelling doom for the rest of the party. I think that in addition to that, you can also have uh, uh, combats that integrate complex encounters. You know, a room that is filling up with water might also release, you know, piranha into the, uh, into the room as well for the players to fight. This is kind of a different uh, way of adding things for the other players to do. While the rogue is desperately trying to get the door open and unlocked so that everyone can escape the room that is filling up with water, the other characters have to fight off the murderous fish to prevent the rogue from being eaten. This is just another facet of adding something for the other players to do. And I think it works particularly well in some of those environments. Once again, you want to kind of start those, though, from the opposite side. You're balancing them as a complex trap with a minor fight. You gotta kind of pick which one it's gonna be. It's either mostly a trap or either mostly a fight. The other thing should be a light accent element. So I hope that'll help you use some traps in your game. I personally find that traps are a, a, a very important part of the GM's toolkit. They are a way for the GM to challenge the party to to take a dip out of their resources uh, without necessarily um, including an entire encounter. They're a way for the dungeon environment itself to speak to the player characters, right? Uh, if they're in, you know, the temple to a serpent god, you can certainly have a bunch of snake men, you know, serpent folk. Uh, you can certainly have them fight a bunch of snakes. You know, they can. there can be pools of acid and, you know, uh, things for them to fall in. But a trap that, you know, causes magical vipers to come streaking out at them and hit them. All of these things add to the flavor. It's just another way that the environment can speak to the story you're trying to tell. So in that regard, it's no different than, you know, it's, it's no different than describing a scene, setting up monsters. This is just another piece in the GM's toolkit to kind of fully convey a well-rounded, complete story. And to top it off, most games have characters whose job it is to deal with them. 
So including them is kind of another facet of your job. If the players decide to make a character that's entirely focused on destroying undead and you don't include any undead for them to destroy, you're not using all the tools that you have available to you. The same goes for if your group has a rogue or someone focused on traps. You're going to want to add those to your game. You're going to want to give them a chance to solve them. This isn't a chance for, this isn't necessarily the spot for you to flex and make them, you know, fall victim to the trap every time. Succeeding is what their characters are designed to do, and your job is to give them some opportunities to do that. Traps are a big component of how you pull that off. So shorter lecture here today. I think traps aren't a, a huge topic of discussion, but I think that covers the topic rather nicely. I didn't want to get into specific mechanics of traps and timers and DCs and attack rolls and all that kind of stuff. The game books themselves cover that relatively well. I don't need to spend a great deal of time here covering it, but I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. Um, I do obviously have a lot of other lectures dealing with other facets of adventure and game design, uh, dealing with encounters and monsters and magic items and all that sort of stuff. So if you want to hear more of my thoughts on that, you can check out the other videos here on my YouTube channel. Um, these lectures are broadcast live on Twitch every Saturday starting at 4 p.m. Uh, if you want to participate in the lecture live, I suggest you join me at twitch.tv backslash Jason Bullman. That's J-A-S-O-N-B-U-L-M-A-H-N. We do a live Q&A after we finish up the video, so if you have questions and would like to see them answered, you can always stop by and see me then. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Uh, I think next week we will probably be off because we are about to hit the week of Virtual Gen Con and next Saturday. I think I'm going to be pretty swamped, so look for me uh, in about two weeks. Thank you for watching, everybody, and we will see you next time.